Okay, um, so here is chapter 10.3, the third part of chapter 10. And we're gonna look at hypothesis tests for population means. So 10.2 was about uh, proportions, 10.3 is about means, just like chapter nine was. So um, the process is gonna be the same. And again, it's one of those cases where I actually do recommend you look at the textbook because it lists all of these steps, um, like a recipe that you just go them, do them right in order. So we're gonna have a null hypothesis. Again, that's the mean that um, we think is gonna happen. Again, the thing we think is true is going to always be the alternate hypothesis. That is the mean is bigger than something or the mean is smaller than something, right? The alternate hypothesis never has an equal sign in it. The null hypothesis does, and it's what we're going to be left with if we can't show that there's really a difference between <clears throat> our data and that hypothesized one. Then we're going to determine our significance level. Then there's going to be algebra. We're going to calculate that test statistic. So again, t is equal to the difference between our hypothesized mean and our data mean divided by the standard error. Again, it's s over square root of n. We're going to use t instead of z because we don't know what the standard deviation is. So not knowing that error is going to give us extra error. <clears throat> It's going to have degrees of freedom of n minus one. We can look that up on the table, although StatCrunch or Excel or whatever will find that for us. Then we compare that test statistic value to our actual value and we get a p-value. And we're going to skip that part. Um, but this idea that um, if our difference is different enough, then we can conclude that something's going on. So we're going to get a p-value from it. If the p-value is small, less than 0.05 in a lot of cases when we use 95%, but whatever value you think is enough, we're going to reject an all hypothesis and conclude that that difference is in fact real. Okay, and again, here's a final step, which is you write an English sentence to say there is in fact a difference because there's statistically significant evidence that supports the alternate hypothesis or we did not find that, so we cannot conclude that there's a difference. Remember, we never proved the null hypothesis. We just failed to reject it. Um, again, the t distribution um, starts to look like z as your sample size gets big. Um, there's a table that you can look it up. We're going to use StatCrunch uh, to calculate all of this for us. All right, so here's an example, and it's about beer. Um, all right, so um, the brewery claims they have 12 ounces in every can, but we suspect that maybe the mean is uh, getting smaller and we're getting uh, ripped off because they're not giving us enough beer. So I go out and collect a random sample of 81 cans of beer, right? We picked 81 so that we could do the square root really easily. And I math, 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 and I calculate that the average amount of beer in each one is 11.82 ounces. I had to pour each can into a scale and weigh it. Um, and then who knows what I had to do to get rid of that uh, beer once I had it. And the sample standard deviation was 0.507 ounces. So in a simple sense, our test case, our test data shows that it was in fact less than 12. However, is there enough evidence to say that that would be true for any random sample? Or was our case just maybe an unlucky one and the brewery can say, well, I'll try it again. And if you try it again, you won't find that again. <clears throat> because again, while we're interested in our sample, we're really interested in our sample as a model for the broader population. All right, so we start with the null hypothesis, which is the mean is supposed to be equal to 12. The other hypothesis is that it's less than 12 ounces of beer. It's one-sided because if we're getting too much beer, nobody complains about that. I suppose if you're an accountant or something working for the brewery, you don't wanna give away too much free beer as you do that. Then we math, math, math. We say 11.82 is whatever 0.18 away from the mean. Our sample standard deviation was 0.507 divided by square root of 81, which is nine. Algebra, algebra, arithmetic, arithmetic, minus 3.195. Now, remember two is our general, if it's bigger than two, it's gonna be big enough. Um, this is a negative one, so minus three. So that's gonna make us think just off, a, off the cuff that it's gonna be. But we're gonna go ahead and calculate, uh, oops. We're going to calculate the p-value and say that it is in fact very tiny and in fact for uh, data like this 1.664 was going to be the value that we're going to use for a 90 percent uh, confidence interval i'm sorry 95 percent one-sided 
uh, hypothesis test. I can't I just said there are. Um, thus, we would conclude that the beer is too small, right? And that's a crisis. So <clears throat> if we had data like that, um, we would be very upset. That is literally what companies do to check the quality of their sample and our quality control class, uh, STAT 374, um, spends the whole semester looking at production models um, to think about how companies uh, use statistics to figure out whether or not um, they're making a good product. And they have very simple ways so that people actually on the factory floor um, can figure out if there's problems. And a lot of those techniques were developed well before we had computers to do it. So they were designed to be very simple. Anyway, with this particular data set, the beer is uh, not full. So that's a big deal. All right, here's another example. Um, in 2009, the mean income for households was 52,029. A simple random sample showed that we had a sample mean of 47,974 in Missouri with a sample standard deviation of 15,000. <clears> so the question then is, is 47,000 enough different than 52 that we could really say, oh, Missouri is significantly lower than the national average? Or would we say, eh, it's about a tie. Missouri is about the same as the other states, right? So that's where that sample standard deviation is going to become important because that'll give us an idea of how, uh, how much variation would we expect. Okay, so we would define our null hypothesis. Um, again, the mean is the national average, so 52,029. Because we didn't have a direction uh, in our hypothesis that it could go either way, that's a not equal to, so that's a two-sided hypothesis. Remember, confidence intervals are always two-sided. Hypothesis tests, though, could just look in one direction. Then we're going to kind of math it up here. We're going to use our formula, and 47,974 minus 52,000 is whatever that is, 4,300 or 4,100 or whatever, divided by the 15,000 divided by square root of 10. That gives us a t-score of minus 0.846. Remember, we expect two to be about where it's going to be interesting. So 0.85 is not as much as that, so that makes us think, well, there's probably not very a very big difference. But we're going to use the computer and <clears throat> find out um, what the value is. Um, and what we find, and in fact, with the table, we find that there's such not a difference that we can't even uh, find it on the table. All right, so here is our data from our fish data from uh, our, that lab that I love to use. Because um, who doesn't love fish from Finland? All right, so you remember there were 56 fish and they had the means like that. Now, this was literally the actual data, uh, the reason why this data was collected. So the claim was that historically fish in this particular lake average 35 centimeters long, right? You remember <clears throat> um, fish are tended, although we weighed the fish, fish really are judged by their length because it's easy to measure how long a fish is. But when you're on a boat or on a ship, it's very hard to weigh a fish because of course everything goes up and down. Anyway, um, what they said was that the mean weight of the fish was, uh, I'm sorry, the mean length of the fish was 35 centimeters. So <clears throat> could they then conclude that the data um, shows that the fish are in fact smaller than they used to be? So we're gonna go to our t-stat, we're gonna go to one sample with data. This is just the same command we used when we did the confidence interval, we're gonna click length. Um, but now, instead of doing the confidence interval like we did down here, we're going to do the hypothesis test. We're going to put in our mean, which is 35. And again, the claim was that the fish had gotten smaller. So we're going to make that a one-sided test. So the alternate hypothesis is that the fish are smaller than 35 centimeters. All right, we're going to do the math. Let the computer do it for us. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And what we see is that the sample mean was 29 and a half. We actually calculated that way back in lab one. The standard deviation, I'm sorry, the standard error because it's divided by the uh, degrees of free, um, n, 56, gives us 1.27. That gives us a t-statistic of minus 4.2. Remember, again, 2 is about where we start to think something fishy is going on. Huh? I cracked myself up. Um, and that gives us a p-value of less than 0 0.0001. Now, the p-value, as we talked about before, is the idea that if we took lots and lots of samples, what percent of them would have data like this? So if the mean were in fact 35, and you said, well, gosh, you know, it's just random error. Well, how often and with just random error would we expect to get data like this? Well, the answer is less than one in 10,000. That's a lot. <clears throat> I should say that's very little, right? So one in 10,000 
tells us that probably this is a real effect and we can't just say, eh, it's random chance, who knows, right? So that is how we can use this data. Now, we can uh, play with this a little bit because it was a one-sided test. We could uh, do what we did. If we did it as a two-sided test, we would then still get the same value here, but now our p-value would be twice as big. In this particular case, it's actually still uh, very, very tiny. And because we don't go to too many decimal places, we would still say there's a real difference. All right, let me work it out again um, with a value of 32. So let's say that instead of 30, oops, instead of saying 35 was the, uh, this data, instead of saying that 35 was our null hypothesis, let's say it was 32, right? So let's say that the previous data was that it was 32. And now we're gonna do our one-sided hypothesis here and we calculate it now. Now what we see is that our p-value is 0.03, okay? So 0.03 being less than 0.05 would tell us that, in fact, 95% of the time, we would uh, find that this is a significant answer, right? So at an alpha of 0.05, the p-value is smaller than that, 0.03, that tells us that there is a difference. Since we're just playing here, let me do it one more time. P, one sample with data, right? If I put in the 32 here, and now I leave this as a two-sided test, that 0.03 is gonna be doubled to 0.06. And at the 0.05 level, that's gonna be not significant. So the fact that we knew which direction it's gonna go turns out to be really important in this uh, version of the story. Okay, so again, to actually run the test, we go to stat t, because it's a t distribution. Remember, that's when we use the data standard deviation. One sample, we have data. Click the column you want. Put in your null hypothesis. What's the claim going to be? Um, <clears throat> again, 32 or 35. Um, and then does it have a direction? Right? And again, all of this comes from our story. It's not from our data. The hypothesis test, the value from it, whether or not it's one-sided or two-sided, that's decided before we really look at our data. And in fact, it's kind of cheating if you look at your data first and then set your hypothesis, which is, of course, exactly what I did here in this last example where I made it 32 instead of 35. Okay, so that is um, how this data works. Now, while we're here for fun, let me mention one other thing. When this data was, was uh, put out, the idea that this eight centimeter fish was included and um, the people who collected the data said, normally our fish uh, nets are so small that an eight centimeter fish wouldn't be caught, it would fall through. And so they say, well, actually, we shouldn't have that data at all. So let me just get rid of that data point, which, you know, if you really feel it's not a valid sample, that makes sense to do. And now we'll click the numbers one more time with data. And we'll keep uh, 35. And we'll go ahead and run our numbers. Now the p-value has gone up to 0 0.0002. So it turns out that eight centimeter fish really was important but not that important because the p-value is still teeny, teeny, tiny. If we say, oh, well, I'll grant it two in 10,000 times that could happen. That's still not very likely. So the idea that anything less than 0.05 is gonna be rejected, assuming we're using 95% confidence, still doesn't give us great uh, you know, interest or belief that the fish haven't actually gotten smaller. Now, fish getting smaller actually is an important issue. Um, Typically fish are getting smaller because of overfishing, which means not enough fish are around to become full adults. And this isn't a class about that, but that is why this data set is kind of interesting because this idea that the average fish sizes are shrinking is one of the reasons. And if you are the people who wanted to fish because you make your livelihood on fish, then this idea of including the uh, uh, eight centimeter fish really does become a thing because now you're kind of saying, oh, you're cheating by throwing in a teeny, teeny, tiny fish and now you can't really, uh, you know, you're not really doing it fairly. All right, last point is I wanna mention, and I kind of started with this, that confidence intervals and hypothesis tests are really two sides of the same procedure. One, confidence intervals say, if we're just given our data, what's a reasonable value for the true uh, mean or the true proportion? Hypothesis test works the other way. It says, 
I think I know what the true mean or the true proportion is, does our data support or refute uh, that claim? <clears throat> okay, so here's just an example from chapter nine. Water bottles are supposed to be a certain size. We can plug it into the confidence interval and say 708 plus or minus. And that gives us a range where we think the true value of um, the mean is. And again, if they're supposed to contain 710, that's a little bit smaller. And you can see from the confidence interval that's true. So um, that kind of does give us that same information, but in a reverse direction. But if we do it as a test, <clears throat> we just switch the formula around. We, we, right, we basically solve for t <clears throat> in our formula and we do the same math, we get 3.16. Now, instead of getting an interval, we now compare that one value. From our table, we would say anything um, more extreme than 2.3 is so extreme that we think the water bottles are too small. Our value is three. Thus, our water bottles are too small. And we have evidence to say that uh, something's going on there. Okay, so this idea that a two-sided hypothesis test and a confidence interval are really doing the exact same thing one is giving you the range of plausible answers. The other one is taking a value and saying, does that fall in that range of plausible values? In some fields, particularly political science, they tend to use confidence intervals and almost never do hypothesis. That's actually not quite true, but especially in surveys, you do confidence intervals and almost never hypothesis tests. On the other hand, in fields like psychology, um, they tend to always do hypothesis tests and almost never do confidence intervals. Does it matter? Not really. It's just which thing you like to do. <laughs> okay, last idea. Just because something is significant in the statistical sense doesn't mean we care. So um, the question is, does the difference matter? And so for instance, there was a big study that came out about a year and a half ago um, from Weight Watchers. And what they found was that Weight Watchers was significantly better than the other diet plans. It was comparing to Nutrisystem and I don't know, whatever the other ones were that they advertise on TV all the time. And Weight Watchers was saying, our difference is significant. So of course they put that in their ads and you know, yay for them. But the actual difference in average weights was about half a pound. And they got that significant difference because of um, the fact that all of those formulas have N in the bottom of the fraction. So the bigger your N, the smaller the bottom, I'm sorry, the smaller the standard error is going to be, the narrower your confidence interval is going to be. So if you increase the sample size enough, you're going to find a significant difference, which again is statistically significant, but who cares, right? That if you like one of those diet plans or the other, they both work some um, on average um, for some people. But the idea that the one was significantly better was not actually very interesting to people who um, really care about that. And so that is kind of the thing I want to close with in this whole chapter on hypothesis tests, that you have to take it in context. We often talk about something called the effect size, which is literally that difference between the two values. So this idea that a half a pound maybe isn't enough that we care um, between the two things. Of course, on all of those diet plans, about 40% of people didn't find significant weight loss um, because you know, of whatever factors that is. So, for the people who did lose weight, losing a half pound extra is maybe cool, but is it enough that you should choose one over the other? I don't know. Um, you know, especially if one was right next near your house, or um, you know, your friend did the one so you could do it together, or something like that. That might well over uh, compensate for that half pound difference. So, all right. Well, that is chapter ten. Again, um, between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. This is really the meat of statistics. When we think about what basic statistics really wants you to look at, it really is this idea of what is a plausible value for an average or a proportion. So all the other chapters leading up to now were really to help get you ready to understand these chapters. So our test that's gonna be coming here in a, a week or two um, is gonna really focus on chapters nine and 10. Chapter eight kind of sets those up with the central limit theorem, but it's kind of a shorter uh, set of things uh, to look at. On the other hand, it's really important. And so this idea that you understand what significance means, what plausible values really are, the idea of Z and T, right? T is a little bit wider, a little bit stouter than Z because um, of this lack of understanding of what the error actually is because we have to use the sample error, the sample standard deviation. 
in our calculation. So we have to add a little bit extra error in um, to do that. So that is chapter 10. So, all right, see you next time.